Hey, welcome to The Deeper Dive. This is a ministry of Bethel Church, where we have one church in three locations. We're out in the valley with Brother Brooks. Brooks. Who is here. Yep. Brooks, good to see you, man. Thanks. Good to be here. Brooks and is still shy because he said pee time last week and got shamed. I know. It's true. Even though <laughs> I thought I was just doing with Dave. He, he thought he was doing with the cool kids. kids. I thought I was safe. But... Not only are we in the valley, we are also just across the river in Pasco. We are with brother Matthew. Matthew. Matthew, how long have you been leading that congregation now? Oh, man. Not very long. <laughs> a few weeks. Yeah. Pretty well got it figured out. Yeah. Everything's just running smooth like That's clockwork. Awesome, no man. issues. Well, yeah. I mean, fixing all the problems from the previous from regime. The previous well, guy. the previous regime was, yeah, kind of a train wreck. But, you yeah. know, we all make mistakes. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> Do you Speaking sorry. of the uh, previous regime, that would be <laughs> Adam. Adam. Brother Adam. Brother Adam. Brother Adam is now leading the church here in Richland. Well, actually, all three, so good to have you guys. Well, I got a question for you guys to start off. You guys have all been leading churches for quite some time, right? Both smaller churches and bigger churches. What, what has been one of the biggest game changers for you in leading a church in the last few years? And by a game changer, changer it's kind of an aha moment. So you've been leading this church, and you think back like, oh, my gosh, yes, okay, you start figuring something out or it's um, a paradigm shifter or something like that. Mm. What comes to mind when I ask that kind of a question? Well, here, here's an answer you're, you're going to love, Dave. Let's hear it. This is an answer just for you. I think the whole leadership pipeline stuff coming here, I think that really was a game changer. Mm -hmm. um, so coming from my last church context, I thought we had a decent, halfway decent system for like onboarding people. Until I saw this and I was like, oh my gosh, we did such a horrible job. Yeah, we are. Like, <laughs> there's, this could be so much better and it's so much better for our people. Hmm. You want to explain you... Leadership Pipeline for yeah. anyone that might be wondering what that means? Yep, yep, good call. Uh, I mean, so really it's just how do we develop people in our church um, at, at various levels of leadership? Hmm. Uh, having proper onboarding to get them at that level where they're a team member. How do we move them up into leaders? How do we move them up into maybe coaches or area leads? And having an intentional process uh, to find them, uh, to have them kind of reflect on that. We can assess them a little bit and kind of equip them uh, and mentor them into the spot and then have ongoing stuff for them, selecting those materials that they're going to go through, the content, having all of that ready to go uh, for all of our departments. Okay, and, that, and by the way, that the pipeline is something we're trying to use. We are using it in all three campuses. Right. Really just trying to build our infrastructure so we actually are raising up leaders. Yeah. All right, going back to the question. So I don't want to... Yeah, go ahead. You, we didn't know you were asking this question, so these aren't premeditated plugs for Ministries at Bethel, but um, had never heard of Rooted before coming to Bethel and went through Rooted in January, started in September 2020, went through it January 2021. I remember coming home and telling Amanda the first four, five, six weeks how amazing it was to see life change happening at the quantity it was happening, like right in front of your eyes. And doing ministry at the church, the churches previously, it was a, there, there was life change, but there wasn't a catalyst for discipleship and life change like Rooted provides. And it was just, a, it was amazing. And now that I've been out of Rooted for a while, hearing all the stories, it's like every time we go through this, it's not the same experience for everybody, but it is one of probably many ways to jumpstart someone's relationship with Christ, this communal, intensive 10, 11 week experience and then to celebrate it together. Like, I, I'm like, how have we never done this before? And just sort of waited for people to come in and experience life change over the course of time rather than saying, let's actually find a way to get people together and see what the Holy Spirit can do in this community, in these people's mm -hmm. lives. So I'm a big believer in that. That's awesome. Kind of paradigm shift. No, that's really good. Uh, by the way, when I, went, when I went through, I've been through it twice. Did it once with just kind of our, all our leaders number of our leaders here at the church. Mm -hmm. That was one great experience. And then did it with people that didn't, didn't hardly didn't know anything about the church. Just two different experiences, but mm -hmm. just both both excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about you, Brooks? What are you going to plug? <laughs> what am I going to plug? Well, <laughs> I was going to say rooted, but I was, I was going to say it for a different reason, Go for Matthew, it. or Adam. Um, <clears throat> uh, as a 
yeah, it's a catalyst for, for life change. It's also a, use this word incubator for small groups. Mm -hmm. And that has been the thing in my, in my previous, uh, uh, ministry context that was, was Mm -hmm. difficult to, how do we start new small groups? Um, uh, we have a goal in Prosser that I want, I want to see, I, I think a healthy church, a, a fully activated church is 60% of the people in small groups. Um, and how do you get there is it's hard because you have to create new small groups mm-hmm. rooted really, really helps with that as an incubator for small groups. You get these people going through a program, um, that, that is tailor made really to, to launch small groups. Um, uh, believe it or not, it's it's a hard thing for a lot of churches to get people into small groups. Everyone says they want yeah. community, but for some reason, even though everyone says they want community, people are not always willing or eager to step into community, <laughs> and yeah. rooted really helps with that. So I was going to say rooted, but for a different reason. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, part of the reason I ask is we're, we're coming across a story that you guys preached on last week out of, um, let's see, it's a... Uh, chapter 10, right? Yeah, chapter 10 in the book of Acts, <clears throat> where Peter, after he has this vision, he's sent to talk with uh, Cornelius, who's a Gentile. And this is an absolute game changer for Peter. This is huge. I don't know if if you guys, if we could just relate that through our own lives, but I don't know if you guys have ever had kind of game-changing moments just in your own walk with Christ that literally just open the door onto something. Mm. I don't know if something comes to your mind even right now, even as I say that. I, I, well, here's something that came to my mind. I, I used to remember talking with my brother-in-law this years ago. I've been sharing Christ with him, and he's, he's really sharp, you know, and he could bring up a bunch of stuff, and he was, he was actually really annoying. And I remember one time I called him up. And I might have shared this several weeks ago. I called him up, and we're just talking, and all of a sudden I realized a little bit of a change in, his, in the way he was talking to me. And he stopped, and he just goes, you know what? Oh. So Jesus died for me, not just for like the world, but for me. Mm. And I know at that point, I think he was just born again mm. right then. Like we stopped and did the prayer thing. We did do that. I think that's where we had talked about it before. But that boom is like the, it's like the veil was taken off his, his eyes, right? Mm. And those are some of the things that the Spirit of God does to us some of the things that the Lord has been doing in this progression of revelation from you know the Old Testament into the New New Testament. So I wonder if one of you guys could share with us what what is going on in chapter ten with Cornelius and Peter. Can one of you guys kind of summarize that for us? Sure. There's there's two things happening at once that Peter Peter's hungry and he's on the roof and he gets a vision of a sheet coming down across the entire cosmos filled with a bunch of animals that up until that point were unclean for Jews to touch or be around or eat. And God is convincing Peter that these things that he called unclean or common are now he's able to eat or he's able to, to be around. Mm -hmm. And it's this opening up of the doors to the Gentile world. And at the same time, Cornelius is being told to go send for Peter to come to Cornelius's house. <clears throat> so as Peter's getting this vision, these men come from Cornelius saying, Hey, we want to come back with us. And so Peter does, Peter comes back with these servants back to Cornelius's house. And he announces to them that, Hey, at one time it was not right for me to associate with you. Here is my vision. And then he actually has presumably like a meal with them and engages with them. And then as we're going to see next week or this coming week, that the Holy spirit falls on the Gentiles for almost like a Pentecost 2.0 for the Gentile world. So it's this really this resetting of, for Peter, at least in his mind, of who, who is included in the family of God. A resetting, you could say, of the, the, ta- the family table to now include those that at one time were excluded from the family. Mm-hmm. So a couple visions. No. Adam, lesson. is it safe to, is, is, this a, is it right that, that Cornelius is the first um, Gentile convert that we see in Acts? Is that, is that right? Uh, well, the Ethiopian eunuch. Would okay, be that's right. The, the, kind of the, the foretaste of what will come yeah, in Acts that's right. chapter yeah. 10. Because Cornelius, what, what we're seeing here is really, I think it can be lost on some of our readers and, and listeners that Cornelius is really like the, the gateway to the Gentile yeah. believers. And we don't really know what happened with the Ethiopian eunuch, but like we can kind of track that story. Like okay, he's traveling back to Ethiopia. He's. Yeah. So we assume that like he he took a message somewhere, but well, the church, like the early church, the first few centuries, there's a very strong presence of the kingdom in Africa. Yeah, 
Yeah. Not just because the Ethiopian eunuch went back, but right. But that had to start from somewhere, yeah. so we can, you know, that was okay. That had to start from somewhere. But where, what we see here is this is the, a, a shift in, in Acts where we see this now now reaching non Jewish people. Yeah. Um, and starting with Cornelius, and I find it so fascinating that. Cornelius is a man of authority and power yeah. and the gospel goes to him first. And I, I don't, I don't want to like put too much emphasis or weight on that, but it is, there is some yeah. significance there that, um, he was, he, he, this was a man, the centurions were responsible for overseeing executions. Um, and he, he, he was like two or three people removed from Caesar that <laughs> he, that he was a part of a cohort of 600 men, or, or uh, yes, and and each one of those men had each one of those regiments had had a, a those each one of those hundred centurions had a had a leader of which Cornelius was one of them, mm. and there was a man over that over all those six hundred, yeah. and uh, that person was likely close to Caesar. So, you know, it's just it's just interesting that that why did God choose to use Cornelius as this way to open the door to, to Gentile believers. Um, just, there's a lot to fascinating things. I think we could, we could put too much, too much emphasis on it, but we could also put not enough emphasis on it too. So if we could delve into a little bit of Peter's mindset, why was this such a, go back to my word, use it a little bit ago, a game changer, a paradigm shifter for Peter. So if we can get, go into his psyche a little bit, because I think for us, it's like, well, God loves all people, doesn't he? I mean, mm-hmm. we just take it, right. take it for granted. And yet, here, this uh, this is this is very powerful to the uh, you know the, the, these these original or these uh, first Jewish believers in Christ. Well, for so long in the in Judaism in the Old Testament, even some of their their laws outside of Torah, it restricted certain things for them in terms of their diet. Like they couldn't eat particular foods, pigs being one of them, so they couldn't eat bacon. Just what a bummer. tough, what a bummer. tough life. Kind of, yeah. Rough yeah, it's going to be on this side of the cross. Right. They couldn't come into contact with things of death, whether it was blood or like a, a corpse. And it had to do with their their table fellowship with God in the temple. So there were certain things restricted um, to set them apart so that they could enter the, the, the presence of God. So God laid some of these out for a time to separate Israel so they could be this blessing to the world. And so the these unclean animals, you can read about them. I think it's in Leviticus 11, isn't it? Or 12? And you can read about a lot of the animals that he sees in this vision at one time were restricted, which meant you were restricted from the people who ate them for a time. And now, this has been the plan all along, but God is ripping back the veil or ripping back the, the dividing wall between Gentile and Jew and saying, these things are no longer unclean or common. And so... You can now have table fellowship and access because Jesus Jesus has, ha- has now caused Jew and Gentile to enter into God's presence through Christ. And so there's no more dividing walls. And that's the paradigm shift for Peter because, like he says in this passage, I've never touched or eaten anything that's common or unclean. And Jesus is saying, or God is saying, well, now you can't. And you can be with people who <clears throat> come from different backgrounds and different ethnicities and different customs, and you can join them now because of Christ. Have you guys felt this tension, like almost throughout the Bible, of on the one hand, a separateness being called out from the people, and yet on the other hand, we're all together, we're united, we're one people, we're to love each other. I mean, sometimes, at least for me, that it's like, oh my gosh, we seem to be, like, it, which, 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 one, which one is it? You know, are we to be separate or are we to be right in there with people and we're to love them and live with them and all that sort of thing? Yeah, that be yes. in the world, but yeah. not of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, Always attention. Go ahead, Brooks. I was cutting you off. Well, I was just gonna say the, the answer is yes. Like both. Uh, the the purity laws and things like that. I, I, mean, I might be taking a step back or take, going in a different direction than you are intending, Dawson. But the purity laws are interesting because the it was established because of God's holiness mm-hmm. and because God is so other than us that we we had we. Um, or the Israelites couldn't, if they wanted to approach God, he was so holy, he was so other that they had to restrict what they did, said, touched, um, ate. And so, so 
it's fascinating because it's like, hey, you are not whole. Now you are you are considered holy not because of what you do or don't do, but because of what Jesus has done. Mm-hmm. So that means not only are you holy, but a Gentile can be holy too if if he puts or she puts his faith in Jesus. Um, so that, that I don't know if that helps under like it, our approach to how to interact with the world, but the um it's it's not who we associate with or what we do or don't do that makes us holy it's jesus that makes us holy and it's jesus that that makes us righteous before god so so it's not if we we can hang out with anybody or be around anybody or touch a dead thing or dead object and that's not going to taint our relationship with god because our because it depends on what jesus has done um, i think there are some Sometimes people can lean so far the other direction to say, man, I do not want to associate with things of the world because it, 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 yeah, if it makes me, makes me bad. It's like, well, yes and no. I mean, there's some things that you, you want to avoid because it's sinful, but if there's certain people you're avoiding or certain circumstances you're avoiding that maybe God wants you to reach those people. What do you think, as you go back, we go back in the Old Testament, some of, some of the laws you can see like cleanliness laws, hygiene laws, you can kind of see, okay, the Lord is trying to maybe teach him some things about <laughs> how to be separate, but to be clean, right? So you don't get sick. But then a number of the laws are just like, you know, like don't put two different kinds of thread together and this sort of thing. Why, why would God do that? Like, why would he, what is the purpose of those laws? Like the ceremonial <clears throat> law, mm-hmm. and as opposed to just like some of the moral law. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that is, that's, that's a great question. This would not be all of it. One small part of it, I think, is just so that they stand out. Like some of the things are seemingly odd to us, but most of them, so that's, that's part of it, right? Like he wants the nation to stand out because yeah. God says, as I am holy, as I am set apart, as I'm, you are also to stand out. Yeah. But most of those also usually has some sort of reflection of his character, mm-hmm. like the two different threads. We're not going to mix things. This idea of like just straight purity that cannot be tainted or like is woven into the fabric of their society where they would see, see what I did there with the woven? Quite literally woven <laughs> into the fabric, uh, that they would see that and say, oh yeah, we are supposed to be pure and separate. Like it's not, they're not arbitrary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you, some of them, <clears throat> I've, in my reading, some scholars debate if this is actually the case, but some of these animals were worshiped by other, um, yeah. by other nations. And so by saying, you're not going to even come into contact with these, you're not being tainted by anything that would be caught up in the worship of a, of a pagan God, which could be part of it too. And then like the idea of death and there's a number of different things that they're to avoid that have some level of death involved in them, that God is the God of life. And so he wants his people to be separate from death, which Jesus, like in his ministry, he has no problem. He, he can, he can overcome the forces of death through his power. And, and so Jesus reverses those things. But in the old Testament, as they're waiting, there are some things that God's like, I want you to stay away from those. So that death isn't entering into the situation because I'm a God of life. Okay. I wonder, I wonder I'll, if we p- could... I'll put in a quick plug. Yeah, here. go ahead. Um, uh, the Bible pro- uh, yeah, Bible Project. Mm-hmm. Um, if you just YouTube, go Bible Project and Holy or Holiness has a good yeah. video. I think it's like under 10 minutes that talks about the the purity laws in Leviticus and why they existed and and how Jesus mm-hmm. speaks into that. So if you're curious about, it, I mean, I would say, hey, we'll link it in the show notes. But I don't yeah. even think we have show notes anymore. So, so. You, you, everyone has access to Google. <laughs> Just Google <laughs> Bible Project. And if not, get access to Google. <laughs> yeah. Come on. And if you haven't checked out Bible Project, <laughs> it's it's a great thing to check out. There's yeah. so many good resources. Whenever I hear Amanda's phone, like something's playing in the background, she's usually listening it's to. It's usually it. Tim Mackey. Tim Keller about. or Tim Mackey. Yeah, but Tim Mackey from Bible Project is. It's a good use of time. Yeah. So I wonder if, if we go back. She's to not listening that. to my sermons. I should just. Well, say. I, was, I, was I always tell her about that. Like, yeah, she's. Come on. It's okay. Listen to me. Yeah. No, that's you right. keep saying it's okay. No, but it's, it's like a, it's okay. okay. It's, it's okay. It's fine. It's, fine. Yeah, it's okay. It's fine. It doesn't it's fine. bother it's fine. me. I, wonder I if, listen to your sermons, Adam. Thanks, Brooks. <laughs> what if the Lord, all the way along, remember the Lord is teaching these people, right? And they're living in this absolutely pagan context. And, and they're, they're coming to a situation where they had been slaves, right? For, you know, good number of years, being in Egypt for 400 years. And so you're starting out from pretty far back. You don't have a, like, you don't have a, a lot of biblical knowledge because a lot of it hadn't even been written yet. But I wonder if a good part of these purity laws and ceremonial laws were simply 
uh, I shouldn't say simply, were, they were a teaching mechanism by God to teach people to be and to separate out that which is good from that which is evil. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes you go, they're, they're, they're simply teaching methodologies, right? It's not like God is upset about, for once again, uh, Matthew, you know, two different kinds of threads being woven together. It's like, oh, the Lord is upset about that. But the Lord is using it as a teaching mechanism to bring people along, yeah. right? It's kind of, it, it, it just because he doesn't just, he reveals over time. He doesn't just dump everything on right. everybody all at once. There's there's an outworking of his of his teaching. Yeah, I think it, I think, sorry, go, go ahead, Adam. I was going to say, I think God is, especially looking now back through the lens of the gospel through Christ in the Old Testament, God is already teaching Israel and for us to see like this gospel principle of one, one nation, like which oftentimes in the Bible is God's son, Israel being partitioned off from the rest of the world to be this holy nation, to be one group of people. And the idea is always that the one will serve the many, right? So even you get in Isaiah and the prophets, like the servant of the Lord, there's this idea that there's this one body of people or persons that will then bless the world. So a lot of those laws are about that. Now through Christ, Christ is that one. He is Israel and God in the flesh, and he gives his life for, for the many. So that, does that make sense? Like you can read it and see how God is even orchestrating this in the past, that the whole intent of Israel is that they would exist, yes, as God's blessed chosen people, but for the sake of the world, right? Abraham, I'm going to bless you, and all the nations will be blessed through you. Yeah, so eventually pointing toward Christ. Right, so when Christ, you sacrifice on behalf of the entire earth. Yeah, now it just explodes into yeah. this, the one has died for the many, and so the church looks like the many now, although we try to make it look like, right, we partition off from each other as like the one holy group, but like we're a we're a universal, we're not a universal church, like a bunch of universalists, but like <laughs> one church yeah, in every location, right? Like that's that's the ideal. There's no more one for the many. It's... Okay. So we're, what we're kind of looking at, just to kind of take us back, is to get, get into Peter's mindset a little bit. Mm-hmm. What is deeply imprinted in him? I mean, centuries of Jewish law, yeah. like kind of embedded in his mind. But I think going beyond that, just his... Um, the fact that he wouldn't even eat with Gentile people, yeah. you know, th- th- boy, that really gets into your head to even be around these kind of people and to feel like they are, they're not God's people. What that kind of takes me back to is like, remember, remember when the Lord sent Jonah? He's going to send him yeah, to the people yeah. in Nineveh. Yeah. What does Jonah do? He's like, dude, I'm out. Yeah, I'm bouncing yeah. the other way because yeah. I know you'll redeem these people that yeah, I hate. because I know that you're merciful. Exactly. I, I yeah. can't stand these people. I hate these people. Look, they've done to us. They've murdered us for, cent- for centuries. Mm. So, yeah, it, it, it is... It, Wild to me, and and it should be wild to our hearers or listeners that w- what Peter does here. One, he's in, he's in the house of a tanner, which that's just lost on us because that's yep. we don't know what that means. Like that that is, uh, yeah, like like it's like smelly, it's gross. It is. Um, they they were usually on the outskirts of town because you could kind of smell them from ar- mm-hmm. uh, from around. Um, I think I read one commentator. I, I I don't know the validity of this, but it sounds wild that if a woman was engaged and she found out that he was a tanner, that that she she had uh, she had license to period of time we can get out of it. Yep. How could that guy hide that he was? A I tanner don't know. He smelled <laughs> terrible. <laughs> So that's this is the context that Peter is in. So yeah. not only that, like he's he's our, his heart is already. It seems like the gospel has already started to soften his heart yeah. a little bit um, to, uh, yeah, purity laws or restrictions because now he's he's living with this guy for for a time that is ceremonial unclean because he's been he's dealing with a bunch of dead carcasses. Um, so he's, so his heart has already begun to be softened and then he gets these messengers from Cornelius and he has all, it, it, it would seem that every Jewish bone in his body would say, I can't go and fellowship with a bunch of Gentiles and probably eat with them. He right? says as much. Yeah. Lord. Yes. So, Ow. so it, that, that I, I just, how wild that is yeah. of the, the transformation, um, where Peter was like a. Jew of a Jew, like he he was a very Jewish man, um, followed the law well, and uh, to see that transformation of like, okay, I'm gonna my heart's gonna be soft, and I'm gonna stay with this guy who's ceremonial and ceremonial ceremonially unclean yeah. in a tanner, and then I'm gonna go hang out with a bunch of a room full of Gentiles, a house full of Gentiles, because it says Cornelius gathered all of his yeah. friends and family, and he's like, man, this guy's gonna tell us something awesome. Actually, he Cornelius thinks he's like God. Because he bows bows down to him, but just it, it, it's it. I can't remember. 
sorry, I'm talking a lot here, but I can't remember who's, who said this. I think it may have been when we had the, that guy that came out for the difficult conversations. Oh, oh uh, Tim Muhoff. Muhoff, yeah. yeah dip- I think he kind of went through of what it takes to change someone's mind. Yeah. Do you remember talking about this? And and there's like our mind can be changed, but our actions it takes a long time for our actions to catch up. Yeah. And we can we can believe one thing, but our but our kind of like our soul <laughs> doesn't doesn't change its mind. What we see here in scripture is that Peter, his mind was changed and his heart followed. Uh, because he actually showed up and was hanging out and eating with Gentiles. Yeah, that's pretty powerful. I, I, I'm going to confess something here. So years ago, uh, it's a, you busted me here two weeks ago, Brooks, uh, saying I'm telling South American stories. But oh yeah, I've been, been living <laughs> so in. I didn't, ask, I didn't ask for permission to to if I was to razz nah, you, but I good. figured everyone else does. So <laughs> well, check it out. I, I've been we've been living in Crocs for a good number of years, right? And uh, man, I just found myself like being angry. And finally, one day I'm like, dude, what, like, what is my problem? So I'm, I'm just trying to figure it out. And <clears throat> I was angry at going up like in the slums around or in the city. I was angry at poor people. Mm-hmm. Like I was tired of them. I was tired of them always wanting something from me. I was tired of them always trying to manipulate me. I was tired of the, I was tired of them not, they, they didn't have great education. And I just realized I'm a missionary and I'm prejudiced. Hmm. Like I have a prejudice against the poor because they're annoying me. And I was like, <clears throat> seriously thought, man, maybe I should just leave because I'm like, I'm a loser missionary. <laughs> and then I decided, why, well, dude, I can't do that. I can't do that. So I just brought it to the Lord, man. I, I just confessed it. I said, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of these people. I don't really know. I didn't really care about skin color, but I, economics, not economic status, but economic conditions and, yeah. and, um, uh, education, that sort of thing was just like, it was annoying me. Man, once I saw that though, I brought that to the Lord and I really felt like the Lord just kind of cleaned my heart out. Mm-hmm. You know, I kind of had, I had, a, I, th- I think I had a little bit, a little bit of my own Peter experience. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't think you're alone, Dave. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the cool things in those moments, it's, we can take Christianity for granted and our relationship with Christ for granted. But in this story, we're Cornelius. And so the gospel came to us as a surprise to Peter. Like we're not part of the original crew. We didn't have a place at the table. Huh. And so God has included the four of us, I'm assuming, from, from our lineage, right, into the kingdom, to, the, to a place at the table. And I think when I struggle to have a, a warm heart for people that are different than me, maybe they look different or different economic status, or even Christians who have different views than me on what I think are important issues outside of like gospel issues, I have to remind myself and have my heart warmed by the truth of what God has done for me, that God, God has included me into the family, into a place that I didn't once belong and included me into a sinner into his family. And Hmm. I just think we have to do that so often because if we don't, we get prideful and we start to have these biases towards people or prejudices towards people that really don't make any sense when it's like, you think about your own story. You're like, how could I actually think that when like I'm in the same boat as them. Um, so I don't think you're alone, Dave. And I think it would be interesting for all of us and for our listeners to to even spend some time asking, like, where do we put up walls with people, whether it's an economic thing, political thing, theological thing outside of like the core issues? Where are we putting up walls where we can't imagine having table fellowship with that person? Yeah. Like I can't wow. imagine having table fellowship with someone who voted that way or someone that that, that eats different food than me because they're from a different you know, ethnicity, or they just have different values than I do and ask those things and ask the Lord, like you just said in prayer, Lord, like, why am I doing this? And will you soften my heart to mm-hmm. see the gospel for all people? You know, here Peter said, speaking to the group, right? He said, God has shown me. Yeah. In that case, it was in a vision. Yeah. And I thought in my case, God showed me because I was trying to figure out why, why was I running around all angry all the time? Right. And he, he did like, and that was, it was so humbling and so mm-hmm. it was devastating. I was like, what the, what? I mean, I was like, I was looking in the mirror and I didn't like what I was seeing because I never, I had never thought of myself that way. Mm-hmm. I just mm-hmm. thought, no, dude, I'm good with all people, man. I was kind of prideful about that. And then came to find out, yeah, I'm kind of not. Mm-hmm. So I better, I got, I got to get over it, man. I need, I need the spirit's power. I'm the one who needs the gospel to get me over the hump or I'm not going to love these people. And then maybe I should go home. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, once right. God's work's done, it's done in you. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're, you're kind of just the other wrinkle to it, though. So I would agree with all that, right? And even in my own journey, like that was a big thing, being like recognizing, okay, I am also a missionary. It's not where we go that makes us the missionary. It's the mission that we are on that makes yeah. us a missionary. Like that was a big deal for me. But yeah. I also know there's the other side of it, too, where sometimes I feel like, I don't know if you guys would agree with this or not, but sometimes I feel like as kind of American Christians, sometimes we've lost that edge of where we are not different anymore. Huh. That there is still a part of us that should stand out. Yeah. And I think, you know, there, there is some wisdom to that idea of like, hey, well, there are certain things that we should be careful about mm-hmm. so that, you know, when people look at us, they would immediately see the difference. And so as you're reflecting on who would be that person I would never share the gospel with, how do I do that? I would also reflect on what in my life looks different so that when I actually do have table fellowship, yeah, something actually stands out. So then when you're sitting around a table and they're talking about Game of Thrones, you're like, I don't watch Game of Thrones. Right. I'm, I'm going to stand out, right? I mean, that's, yeah. that's like this kind of an easy... Uh, yeah. I mean, we kind of do this already because all of us in this room, except for Matthew, really love the Seahawks and we sit around <laughs> with the Bronco yeah. yep. and have lunch I'm every glad, Monday I'm proud together. to stand out. Yeah, I'm in the world, but not of it. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a good point. And I, I think when we put it into the church perspective and we're not talking about unbelievers, but we're talking about who we have table fellowship with within the kingdom, asking ourselves, what are we letting divide us? Are we letting food... Like the kingdom's not about eating or drinking, right? Yep. As yeah. yep. Paul says, uh, for us, like wh- who are those Christians and believers in our circle or even just on the internet that we don't know, but we're antagonistic toward? Like what are we letting divide us that Jesus looks at and says, are you kidding me? Like I died for you guys to unite you and you're dividing over what food you like or, you what, know. What political what party. What political you're party or even just what, yeah, just different different things that we are so polarized over that it's like, man, can't you hold to the core truth and disagree on certain things? But eat together. That's what the communion table I think is so beautiful. I wish we were, I wish we did communion yesterday because it is the table fellowship meal that Jesus has brought to unite us. And if we're looking at each other saying like, I can't be united to you, like we're not coming to the table, right? Because we're supposed to be seeing Jesus who unites us by his blood. So man, I, I think even in this time, even though we're a couple years out of COVID and the 2016 to 2020, like we're still living in so much division and polarization in the church that the world looks at and they don't see any anything different than what they are living. That would be one of the things I think that we were saying, like, how could we stand out of the church? Like, wouldn't that be it? Like, if we yeah. were actually united, I think people are hungry for that. People are sick of division. They're sick yeah. of being, who wants to be angry all the time? Right. What would it come, be to, like, come into the church and you're like, oh, man. Well, I'm pretty sure Jesus and John say, like, they will know you by your... That, by love. our T-shirts. By your love, which is <laughs> sacrificial oh. and hard. That was close. Hey, well, Matthew and Adam, I think you guys have kind of brought this together for us, both this sep- the idea of us being separate and us being united to people in the world that we're supposed to reach out to. So really appreciate that. Well, thanks, you guys. I mean, I, th- I really feel like we've kind of got- gotten deep into this subject, which is what we're supposed to be doing on the deeper dive. Man, I just really appreciate you guys. And um, one of the things we've heard from people who have listened to the deeper dive is that they appreciate the genuine camaraderie that we have. And I just say I, that that is genuine. We're not we're not faking that. At least most of the time, we're not faking it. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Anyway, this is a deeper dive. If you want to um, check out Bethel Church a little bit further, you can. But just get on to Bethel.ch, and uh, you can see a number of the ministries that we're involved in. Thank you.